Welcome to the Doctor's Kitchen with me, Dr. Rupi. Today, my guest is Karen O'Donoghue. You will know her from the Happy Tummy Company. She is an incredible advocate for organic farming as well as seed banks as well. We have a wonderful conversation about her background, how she overcame IBS, and created this incredible bread that was also labeled the poo bread. Yes, it was called the poo bread. On top of spaghetti, all covered in ice. You'll see me create a wonderful dish with white beans, passata, pomegranate molasses, all those beautiful ingredients, barberries, coriander seeds, packed full of flavor, serve it with some rocket, and we top it with pomegranate seeds and her incredible bread. All bread is not equal. This is certainly some of the best bread that money can buy. I've made this meal because I want to try your delicious bread with it. Uh, it's a simple stew, some cannellini beans, uh, but you could use chickpea or red kidney bean, whatever beans you want. We're going to go in with some passata, it's just same plain passata, some barberries, which you can get from most supermarkets these days. It's like this tart berry. Um, I love you, have you I love barberry. Before? Yeah, yeah I love one. Thanks. It's kind of like a, the anti goji berry. Mm. It's, <laughs> it's tart, it's lemony, it's gorgeous. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Um, rose petals uh, for some sweetness and some pomegranate molasses as well. We're going to get cracking with that. I'm also going to um, add some coriander seeds, some cumin seeds to this pan. And everything's going to go in one pan. It's Amazing, I love a one pan dish. Exactly. We met three years ago on February the 5th at a Fair Healthy yes. thing. And you were there supporting um, Dr. Hazel. Yes. Um, and I was on a panel with Hazel at the time talking about grains. Yeah, you certainly were the most impressive in, in terms of like the people that I saw on the stage. It's just because you're being so genuine about everything. Like yeah. Everyone else is kind of like, you know, dancing around the subject, but you mm. were just like, no, this is what we need to learn. We need to learn about our culture and how we actually need to grow things and what the importance of the soil is and mm -hmm. grains and, you know, a massive champion for bread. I was like, finally, in this gluten-free world of restriction that's religiously focused on carbohydrate restriction yeah you were championing you mm -hmm. know something that has been responsible for the mass globalization of our human race mm -hmm. you know bread so in the 1970s uh when britain became part of the eec farmers that were farming wheat for example had to register the seed that they were growing um, on this national list um, and then they were legally allowed to grow the seed uh, we kind of went from farming thousands and thousands and thousands of varieties of loads of crops, uh, pretty much organically, to a really, really, really small selective group of crops. The way to farm was like, um, yield is everything. So you harvest the grain, you send it to the miller, the miller mills it, it sends it off to whatever bakery in Sussex, um, and then I make bread with it. But the only thing about that is I'm baking with just one variety of wheat. Whereas back in the day, like pre-World War I, across your field, um, and there could be like six, seven, 10 varieties, there could be 30 varieties. So you were growing, you know, legumes, you were growing wheat, you were growing barley, you were growing oats. And then all of that was being sent off to the miller, milling it down. So when I made you a loaf of bread, you were eating like loads and loads and loads of stuff there as opposed to just four ingredients yeah. you know when i started learning about all this this is what excited me and this is what informed my decision around how i'm going to make bread for people mm -hmm. i kind of separate makers into like there's those who nourish and there are those who feed and i've always wanted to nourish yeah. you know corporates came in they were privatizing seed banks they were buying seed banks from government kind of commercial entities started cross-pollinating let's take a tomato plant for example because yeah. we're using passata today so uh one tomato tomato is drought resistant and one tomato is highly vigorous. As a company, I want a drought resistant, highly vigorous plant. So I cross pollinate those. So those are two kind of heritage seeds. You know, they've come from heirloom varieties that have been in, in, in that particular microclimate for, you know, hundreds of years. Um, and, and now I've made a hybrid seed. A lot of the time, those hybrid seeds will never produce another seed. We also bred the root out of the plant. So this is like, what? Where's the nourishment going to come from? This straw that's above the soil, that's almost the same height as all the weeds as well. So we, we need like herbicides, pesticides yeah, yeah. to get rid of the weeds. Mm. 
all these natural structures that were allowing, you know, just plant and the rotation of crop to like function very, very well and sustainably was just eradicated overnight. Um, and the system post World War II to feed people never changed. So here we are in 2020, 60% of the seeds that are legally allowed to be traded worldwide are owned by four companies, which are doing bad, bad stuff to the soil. Yeah. So that's super interesting. We've got a system that prioritizes yield by any means necessary, exactly. that doesn't adequately absorb nutrients deep enough from the soil and therefore becomes more reliant on other chemical per, uh, pesticides and fertilizers and, and um, herbicides to actually allow them to grow in a, in a nutrient depleted Absolutely. soil. Absolutely. What's happening now is social mobilization is kind of taking off again because climate change has become such like a worry. Yeah. Um, since 2008 in the UK, you are allowed to market and produce heritage seeds again, but you have to be fair certified and you have to have money to be able to pay to be the owner of the seed and kind of the safeguard of the seed. And you have to have lots of space. And some of these farmers have sourced um, seeds that are like 10,000 years. Like this wow. guy, John Letts, he's a farmer in Oxfordshire and he went to Egypt and he got these seeds that had been like buried with Tutankhamun and like we were at this event the other night and he like showed me the seed this like black seed and I was like oh my god John that's amazing and like everyone was like my best friend was with me she's a psychotherapist she was like what's going on here like am I missing something I'm like mate like this is amazing Uh, this is a organic stone ground um, heritage wheat loaf which also has got some rye in it wow. um, and the reason I put rye in this loaf is because um, uh, the farmer who farms this rye uh, just completed a study with the EU uh, which kind of has indicated that the antioxidant um, contents of rye are off the scale yeah. um, and so I guess yeah I just want to incorporate a bit of rye into all my recipes now for that reason. Honestly rye is like one of my favorite ingredients right now like you said it's off the charts in terms of yeah. antioxidant profile there's got some there's some prebiotics as well that actually have been shown to nurture um, certain types of microbes in your gut microbiota as well. Yeah. The seeds that were used to make this bread um, he actually sourced from both Austria um, and the uh, bread lab in Washington. Um, and, and the reason being is because, uh, because can, of- Can I just stop you there? Yeah. Bread lab in Washington, yeah. there's a bread lab. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta oh visit him. Oh my God. Yeah, um, so yeah, so um, Austrian seeds, there's some Russian seed in there as well. And it's just 5% white. So obviously in the UK right now, 60% um, of the bread that is eaten is just white. Oh wow. So like that's just hugely calorific yeah. and no really good Absolutely. enzymes or minerals yeah. or anything yeah. in there. It's just stripping everything out exactly. of it, the B yeah. vitamins and yeah. the fiber. And like and no wonder you're putting on weight by yeah. eating that bread. Yeah. I mean, And that's why I think bread has a massive branding 100%. problem. Because I did a whole section in my first book about the issues with gluten that people are finding mm -hmm. that are not literally related to gluten intolerance is what we've done to 100%. gluten containing products yeah, like pasta and breads and everything yeah. else and when you like you know fertilize a wheat grain you know it's kind of like giving a wheat grain crack cocaine or like you know huge amounts of sugar whereas with ancient old organic varieties the proteins are so so long you know the proteins that do affect people with celiac disease and gluten intolerance aren't there in any you know huge quantities at all like they're so small that you know, if someone comes to me and I'm, oh, I'm gluten intolerant, I'm celiac, I'm like, you know what, try this bread, iron corn, wheat, fermented for 48 hours, see how you feel. And they're like, mate, yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. I'm back on the bread. Yeah. So Can I just say, the way one. you talk about bread is almost like the way a sommelier would talk about wine. Has anyone told you that? I will tell you something. I've come never to expect greatness from a Cab Franc, and this one is no different. It's kind of a hollow, flabby, overripe. I don't know. It tastes pretty good to me. No, not Honestly, I think there's so many parallels between what you just said, because you've talked about the microclimate, the certain types of growers, where yeah. you got the seeds from, because that's exactly how sommeliers and winemakers would also think about the, yeah. the complex product that they're creating. And this is a beautiful, complex product. And actually, to be perfectly honest, the holy trinity for me is cheese, wine and bread. <laughs> So are you going to and then, about this yeah, one? this yeah, is this is actually pretty similar, but in this I've incorporated yeah, a, a seed. <laughs> so this is an einkorn seed, uh, which oh, was this, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is like the first wheat um, 
ever planted, yeah. really. Um, so that's quite cool. Lots of bakers are so obsessed with the aesthetics of a loaf. Yeah. They're packing it with white wheat flour, mm. high protein, Canadian mm. flours, all that kind of stuff. Um, and they're not cool with the fact that like maybe a loaf is just a bit lower. Yeah. A loaf shouldn't be like really, really holy yeah. and like, it should look a bit denser. Yeah, like yeah, density yeah. and fiber, it's just a thing that yeah. goes hand in hand. I think we need to embrace less aesthetically pleasing food Agreed. in general, isn't Agreed. it? Agreed, yeah. yeah. I use a rye starter to make all my bread and uh -huh. um, for me it's all about when I approach a new recipe or a bread for me I'm starting with like okay I want to acidify the loaf completely so that we have complete enzyme activity we've got loads of minerals and vitamins coming out of there but I also want it to taste good I want someone to become addicted to yeah. this taste yeah. you know what I mean <laughs> and I think for me now I'm so consumed by nourishment that it's so difficult to eat something without knowing I'm, I'm, I'm not going to absorb the most amount of minerals and vitamins yeah. I could. So yeah. I think the more you research and the more you study, you know, knowledge just makes you much more functional. When I was maybe 10 years old, my mom got cancer for the first time. And I remember her being in the house and you know, being on the chemo and like all the cancer treatments that you're on. Um, and having this like kind of epiphany, when I'm older, I'm gonna create a brand that's all about preventative medicine. You know, back in the day, Rupi, you know when you go to a doctor, they didn't talk about lifestyle medicine. Mm. The older I got, the more my IBS became an issue for me. Mm. My mom was bringing me to the, these doctors and they were, you know, saying, here's, um, take these laxatives. And I remember my mom every night taking her cancer medication yeah. and she'd do a shot of laxative and then she'd give me a shot of laxative. And I was yeah. like, this is nuts. This is, like my yeah. mom has cancer, fair enough. She has to take the laxative because of all the medication she's on. Yeah. But like, what am I doing? Like a 12, 13 year old girl taking laxative. This yeah. is nuts. Yeah. As my IBS got worse and worse and worse into my early twenties, I was like, if I don't sort this out, my colon, something's gonna happen. Mm. For me then to just go and study um, food science myself, felt very natural. Um, and through these science papers, I obviously discovered, you know, uh, the importance of prebiotic fiber, um, how to consume dietary fiber for someone with IBS. Variety was key. So totally. obviously history taught me that like back in the day, we were eating, you know, 10 varieties of wheat in our bread, and now we weren't. So I was like, okay, well, people didn't have the gut issues we have today, back then. So let's go back to that. Okay, cool. Uh, well, let's say, let's each take one of these okay, breads. Okay, fabulous. Here. There you go. Have I toasted it all right? Oh yeah, this is great. Good, good. Really, really, really great. <laughs> um, and you can freeze the other one and increase the prebiotic fiber oh content of it. Wow. Mmm. The rose is really good in there. That is so good. If you want to carry on listening to our conversation, we're going to be talking about Karen's history, her business, more about bread and actually how we buy new seeds as well and how we need to look more after our soils. Then click on the link below and you'll get the link to our podcast. We'll see you there. Thank you so much for watching this video. There's so many others for you to enjoy right here. Check out the doctorskitchen.com, sign up to the newsletter where I give science-based recipes every single week. There's a podcast, there's two books, there's loads more content on social media, doctors underscore kitchen, and I hope to see you there.